move, unfortunately. So I apologize in advance for that, but uh, I will not stay in one place. Luke, do you want me to start or do I introduce myself? Yeah, I don't introduce myself. Uh, no, no. Who's chairing this? All right, very well. But so, I can introduce you. No, 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 it's just, I'm fine, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, no Pablos, no. Ah, Claire, welcome. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's not make this more formal than it has to be. This is our weekly seminar, and I'm going to uh, give you an overview of some of the research um, myself and um, some of our colleagues are doing in the area of, of uh, citizen science. Um, so, in summary, what I would want to convey today is that citizen science is a truly fascinating subject for web science research for various reasons. Um, I mean, you could look at it at a particular class, as a particular class of socio-technical system, and web science, as I have uh, told Tim this morning when we filmed, is all about the study of large-scale uh, decentralized systems, socio-technical systems like the web. So citizen science is a subclass uh, of such systems and is, and is very, very interesting. Um, it has to do with science and we're scientists, so that's interesting as well, perhaps more interesting than uh, looking at areas which are less familiar to, to um, our own work. Um, it is a fascinating subject because you can look at it, as I will explain later on, from, from, from different angles. Um, you could see it as an exemplar of, of a crowdsourcing application. Um, so you use a crowd of volunteers to carry out a given task. In this, in this uh, case, this would be something related to a scientific experiment. You could look at it um, as a community of volunteers and professional scientists who come together to achieve a common purpose. Very similar to other online communities we know of. And finally, you could look at it as science, as a new form of doing science uh, with challenges and, and with opportunities, or as an educational and public engagement tool. So a way to explain what we are doing to the general public. So various lenses, um, a huge range of citizen science projects as well. Where's Neil? Neil all, knows all about all hundreds of them. So if you actually want to know anything about a particular citizen science project and what they're doing, what they're talking about, whether they're doing well or not so well and why, talk to Neil. Uh, he has a very happy PhD life. Um, so fascinating. Now, what do we do? Um, we look at these three lenses that I've mentioned earlier, so crowdsourcing, um, science, and, and online communities, and trying to help system designers, so those people who are in charge of setting up citizen science instances, with frameworks and theories and methods to study and understand what motivates people to um, contribute in the first place, how you could um, change their behavior and reward them, um, what sort of patterns of design work well or less well, um, and then how to make everything successful, how to make the tasks that are crowdsourced more effective, um, how to understand whether your engagement strategy um, is working well or not, uh, and whether the community of volunteers is, um, is thriving. So these four different types of, of, of methods um, are um, going to be the subject of my talk today. Now, I do this work with uh, several other people in ways. Um, so there's Chris and Neil and Amber, Ramin, um, Sergey, Alan, um, and then the various others who um, have been working with us in Socium, so 
Max and, 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 and Marquis, uh, but also uh, colleagues from the European Project Stars for All, um, from Berlin, from uh, Madrid, uh, from Milano and a few other places. So, so it is um, uh, definitely a, a team effort and uh, you can talk to anyone who see the, the picture on, uh, on this slide about, about it. Okay, so who has never heard of citizen science before? Okay, very well. Um, citizen science is a way to carry out particular aspects of a scientific experiment via crowdsourcing. Um, what does this mean? Why are these slides changing? Um, so this means that I have to talk faster. This means that, um, or I have to interrupt the presentation and see what is going on. Play, use something, something. Use timings? Do you think this is the problem? Yes. Okay, let's try. So, like I was saying, um, certain parts of, of um, a scientific experiment do not need to be carried out by professional scientists. Um, that was the original motivation. Uh, in particular, as, as um, some natural and, uh, sciences and humanities become more and more data intensive, um, and web science definitely plays, plays a role in that, um, scientists need to do data analysis using computational tools. Computational tools are not always as accurate as we would want them to be. So in those cases, you need to have some form of human validation or human input to make those data analysis or data collection processes work better. Um, the way to do that is not to employ a core team, a small team of professional scientists because uh, this would not scale. So you have millions of images to classify in a very short period of time. Um, the way to do that is to use a large number of volunteers. And the way it works, the reason why it works is because the type of human input you need does not require scientific training, professional training. It is based on um, the same type of, uh, of cognitive and percep perception skills that everyone has. So that's basically what this, uh, what this picture shows. Um, this is the anonymous crowd of contributors. Um, anonymous in the sense that we don't make any assumptions or we don't have much of a prerequisite in terms of what these people should or should not know, what kind of skills they should have. This is a collection of images containing, in this case, galaxies, which would need to be classified. Now, this is an example from Zooniverse, the project which is also in my title. Um, the Zooniverse team has told us that they could indeed have trained an algorithm to uh, classify those galaxies um, as accurately as they needed them to be. But it would have taken them a year. In, uh, instead, what they're doing is they're um, reaching out to a million people who um, are willing to help and classify those galaxies and are improving those algorithms as they, as they go. And they classify, they, they do the same type of task that um, they would have perhaps achieved after building the algorithm for 12 months. Um, so they do the same type of task in, in, in something like two weeks. All right, so this is, this is citizen science. Now, from the crowd and the data and the results that they perform, um, professional scientists validate that data, aggregate it, consolidate it, and use it in their own scientific workflows. So that's citizen science. Um, I would like to make the distinguish between something that I call citizen science projects and platforms. Platforms are technologies that host different types of projects. So you can imagine a platform, um, Facebook is a platform, yeah? Facebook games or Facebook applications are projects hosted on that platform. And they take advantage of the fact that there is a community of users, Facebook users, that are registered to the same platform. And this helps the individual projects reach critical mass 
faster. Yeah? Now, not everyone launches their project on a platform for various reasons, because platforms support specific types of, of, of projects or because of historical reasons, because platforms have professional platforms, useful platforms have, have been uh, proposed much later than um, some of the, the, the initial citizen science projects. Now, this slide is, uh, shows a random selection of, of citizen science projects. And like I said um, earlier, there are hundreds and hundreds of them and Neil uh, knows all about them. Um, but I just want to make a number of points. So, um, some of these projects are projects we really engage with. So we are doing research on, 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 on their data, like Galaxy Zoo and, and iWire, which is the project over here. Others are projects um, that I just wanted to, to point to for, uh, for, for specific reasons. So when you look at citizen science projects, you can classify them in various ways. You could think about the type of tasks they are carrying out, they are asking people to carry out. Um, and a lot of online citizen science uh, focuses on data analysis. So like the example with the galaxies, there is some data that needs to be proce processed in a certain way. Uh, and then you put it online and you build a system and an interface to it. Sometimes this interface uh, is very utilitarian, like here's an image, give, show me what you, what you see in it. Sometimes it is actually much more sophisticated than, uh, than that for engagement purposes mainly. Um, um, and the most extreme example in that case is perhaps um, those citizen science projects that build games. So when someone comes to the system, they don't actually see the image and are being asked how many cats do you see in it, but there is a whole game around the cat finding exercise. There's a game narrative, there's an interface, they're all elements that you could, that, that you could imagine, yeah? Um, in this particular case, so this is iWire, a project that we work with, the task is to identify these different areas, 3D areas, um, in a 3D scan of the human brain. The aim is to understand how visual perception works in the human brain, and for that, neuroscientists need to understand which areas in these scans are connected and which aren't. Doing this sort of 3D image analysis is, is not straightforward with AI, and this is why they are, they are using people to do it, but the, the point is that they have built this puzzle. Yeah, so when people go to the system, it's not about here's a 3D scan of the brain. No, the storyline goes, you can solve a puzzle, the puzzle looks like this, you can move the cube around, you get points and so on and so forth. So a paradigm that they're much more comfortable and familiar with. The same in this one, which is, uh, which is called Folded, which is um, um, a game in, uh, in life sciences. Um, some other points, so data collection, Data analysis is a so type of task that, that uh, citizen scientists are asked to, to carry out. Um, it's not always, it doesn't have to be online. So I put here this one example, which is called the T-bag index. Yeah? Um, the aim there is to measure soil pollution. The way to do that is to have lots of samples in different areas. The way they do it, using volunteers is that they ask them to bury tea bags in soil and then to retrieve them and then they analyze whatever happened with the tea and can infer from that a measure of soil pollution. So this is, maybe there is a data entry component online to collect the measurements, but the actual task happens far, far away from the web. Yeah. Um, mobile devices become more and more important in citizen science. So there are versions, or there will be versions of something like Galaxy Zoo that was uh, typically carried out in the browser for, for mobile devices as well. In the same time, mobile devices are used to um, collect data. So people agree to install an app 
on their phone that collect certain types of, of data that is used in, uh, in, in, in science. Final example, uh, I picked it because it is not from this natural life sciences area, but from, from humanities and, 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 um, and, and um, sociology. Uh, very relevant to, to perhaps the times we live in. This is a, uh, this OWL dashboard tries to understand how we make decisions based on what type of information. So basically it is a citizen science platform to collect opinions of people from a wide range of, of, of demographics. Some examples of platforms, so besides Zooniverse, uh, which, which is by far the largest platform, there are many others. Uh, and they're not just for natural sciences, they are for um, humanities, uh, they cover both online and offline exemplars of citizen science um, in various areas. Okay, so I mentioned those three angles um, that you can look at to understand what citizen science is. And the first of them, historically, has been a human computation or crowdsourcing angle. So it was about citizen science projects have been created from the necessity to add additional capabilities, additional resources to professional scientists. And this can take many forms from helping people entering data, like it's been done in the 18th or 19th centuries, to helping improve the algorithms that the scientists are using, uh, as it is in the case of human computation. Now, when you look at citizen science projects and platforms from this angle, you have to deal with a number of questions. You have to ask yourself, how do you, uh, what do you ask people to do? You ask them to classify images, right, but there are many questions that you need to think about. How do you ask them? How do you phrase the questions? Do you give them a, a number of pre-selected answers to choose from? Do you ask the same question to everyone? How many times do you ask the question? What do you do with the answers? Because you do not know, as a scientist, when you have those millions of images with different types of galaxies in them, you don't know which type of galaxy you have in each image. Otherwise, you wouldn't carry out the experiment in the first place, wouldn't need an image an analysis algorithm, yeah? So answers from people might be wrong for various reasons, because people don't pay attention, because the, the task is just too difficult for them, because all images are just black and there are no galaxies in them. So you need to find a way, an effective way, ideally an automatic way, to be able to detect good answers and bad answers. And in the end to be able to say, all right, from all these opinions that I have about this image, this is what I think the subject is. Then you want to look at how people perform, whether this works, yeah? whether people are good at what you're asking them to do, and how to optimize the process, how to make sure that people will continue to contribute if you need them to, that they will engage with the platform the, and the project and the tasks you ask them to do in the way that is most useful um, for the scientist. You could forget all about that and you could say, well, actually, yes, it's great that we've classified the million images, but what's more important is that we have created a community consisting of professional scientists and people who work perhaps in, in uh, scientific journalism and people who are interested in helping science or hobby scientists. And these people come together to solve problems. Some of these problems are very mundane. So yes, we look at the image and we classify the galaxy and we do that 100 times a day, five days in a row, yeah? Other problems are perhaps defined by the community itself. So then, as web scientists, what we're interested to know is what is the fabric that makes this community? What are the roles? What do they do in the first place? Besides what we're asking them to do, which is to classify galaxies. Do they do something else? 
Do they talk about other topics? Do they want, would they discuss other ways to design the task? Are they happy with what they're doing? Would they prefer to do something else? Are there particular roles in a community? Because we all know based on those roles, we can understand who influences the activities and the, and the opinions in the, and, and the community and how. We want to understand patterns of participation. So someone who just comes in to the site, what would happen to them after a while? Are they likely to leave? Can we keep them engaged? If they're very committed to the cause, can we actually promote them, give them more responsibilities if this is what they're looking for? How healthy is that community? Is it growing? Are people actively and constantly talking to each other? And what motivates them to do all these activities? So these are two examples from, from Zooniverse of discussion areas, I would say, social channels that the citizen science platforms have put in place because they have recognized that this helps, that people need and want to have a way to interact with each other, to ask questions to the professional science team, um, and to, to, to carry out this sort of community-related activities. The third important angle from my point of view is, is open science. So the way citizen science works means that we're moving away from a traditional workflow in which a core team of people stand, is, sits in the lab and discusses the experiment design and carries out the experiments and, and measures everything. There is a wider range of people involved. 50,000 people contributed to Galaxy Z. Are they all authors of the papers that the astrophysicists will write? Should they be? Do, we want, do people want to be involved in this sort of scientific professional workflows? And if not, do we need to change them to reflect the fact that science is carried out in this, in this, in this crowdsourced way? What does this mean for reproducibility of experiments, um, for repeatability? What kind of scientific experiments can we imagine that can be carried out by volunteers? What do we cite? All these problems that, that we um, uh, deal with when we talk about, about science and scientific workflows in general. And finally, and this is sort of orthogonal to, to the three areas that I mentioned earlier, education and public engagement. So we can think about citizen science games as a way to teach people about certain types of, of scientific questions. So there the question is, what is the best way to teach? Is something like IY a good teaching method? What would we assess? Do we assess explicitly? It turns out that this sometimes distorts the user experience. People just want to keep playing and not follow tutorials and get feedback and, 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 and get marked. Do we want to do this? How do we design a tutorial automatically based on the content that we have? Um, is there such a thing as learning analytics? which is very common when you have a million of people taking on a course, or in this case, engaging with a game. And what is the best way to, to, to engage? Right, so different angles. The question is, which one to follow? And I think, um, and if we learned anything from the research we've been doing in the last three years, is that you can't really keep these angles apart. There are many aspects um, in looking at citizen science as, as, as a community that influence the way you would design your task from a crowdsourcing point of view, or you would design a tutorial, for instance, if you want to teach people about certain scientific questions. So then the question is what makes citizen science successful? If citizen science is all these different things, how do we know that the objectives of a project have been achieved? Um, and there is some research in this area. Again, Neil is, is, is obsessed with this question for some reason as well. Um, and I've listed just some of them, just some 
artifacts related to citizen science that one could assess using different metrics uh, to, to understand perhaps not success, but to understand how a project or a platform is performing. So you could just look at tasks. How many images have we classified? How many new cats have we found? Uh, how many planets have we found? Perhaps more relevant. Um, how well are people performing? So quality. Is this task perhaps too difficult? And no matter how many people we ask, we just can't, we get so many opinions about what this is or this, sh this should be or shouldn't be, uh, that there is no way to, to consolidate those answers into, into something that, that is accepted and agreed upon. How many people do we engage? This is a metric that means not only that you will most likely complete your tasks, your classifications of galaxies faster if you have more people, but this also means that you have reached out to a wider audience. So many more people now know a little bit more about galaxies. That's something to, be, um, to, to, to celebrate. Um, if you see people then being possibly interested in more advanced topics in the science behind that project, you have an advantage as well. Or you have the data that the crowd has created, which is helping you run your scientific experiments. And you have publications in all those areas, in astrophysics, in chemistry, in biology, in the humanities, in digital humanities, that have been made possible only by the fact that the scientists got that data. Um, you can look at success just from a community point of view or from an engagement point of view, say, um, pretty much like in, in, in any uh, digital marketing scenario. Or you could measure success in learning, like we do here when we teach. Say, uh, if we teach people well, then you will see that in the way they, uh, they perform in the assessments. Like I said, this is, this is um, an active area of research. There's been some work done by our colleagues from, from, from the Zooniverse about this um, a year or so ago. This is not for you to, to read in detail, but to understand um, perhaps what they look at. So they look at how many publications, scientific publications are enabled by the data. Uh, they look at how complete the analysis is, so if people have actually finished all those images, classifying all those images. They also look at something as <sighs> difficult to define as academic impact. But then this is actually quite, quite important for various reasons, because if you have so many different angles to analyze and study and understand citizen science and related to that so many different metrics, there will be trade-offs. So at some point, you will have to decide whether you want to do something that has a very high public engagement impact. Many people understand the area, can relate to it, contribute to it or simply visit the site and comment on Facebook versus something that has a scientific impact where it is really important that you have the data that you need as accurate as you need it when you need it. Yeah? Um, so these areas are not always well aligned and you will have to make decisions. You will have to, we still don't know much about the trade-offs um, between, um, between these different areas, but we have looked into some particular aspects. So, what is this? Is this something you cannot see? Um, so, now I'm going to give you some examples of particular things we have found out. But before I start, let me just say quickly what we have done. So, we're working with system data. So, we have logs of everything that happened 
on in particular projects. And we know how many images, let's say, people have classified and how, so which answers they gave. We know things related to their behavior on the site, like any sort of analytics one would have on a general website. So when do they log in, how often they log in, how long the sessions are, what do they do, how do they move um, between different web pages. We also know if they discuss how they discuss, so what do they post, where they reply to certain things, how long it takes. So we have all this system data that we can analyze. And it is big data, purely from the fact that we have many projects, different projects, so there is a variety, um, and because they have millions and millions of users. We have lots of data about it. But we also have papers that have been published, be that by the science teams, so um, the data that was created in Galaxy Zoo has led to some science around galaxies, but also papers from people like us and other researchers in the same areas who have looked at citizen science as a particular type of online community, for example, and have published about it, yeah? Um, and there are obviously the systems themselves with which we can interact if we visit, visit the sites and register um, and, and, and analyze them. So we have these different sources of information and then we have used a mix of surveys and algorithm design um, and data analysis, so the analysis of the, of, the, of the system data that I mentioned earlier, to try to understand what makes these projects ultimately successful. So first we looked at very standard question in anything that involves lots of people. We looked at who is actually engaging in what type of activity. And we have noticed similar types of patterns as in other large-scale socio-technical systems. So if you know there is this 90 to 10% rule that applies to any sort of web platform where 10% of people do 90% of the work or, 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 or activities in general, um, it is similar. So we've looked in two years ago, we've looked at 10 or so different citizen science projects in Zooniverse and we have looked at how people engage in talk, which are discussion forums, and task, which are the actual things they do, so the classification of the images. 1% of participants contribute more than 70% of all discussions, so this seems to be an a very niche activity and 30% of all classifications. Now, why is this important? So what? It is important because if you identify these different levels of engagement, you could go a step further and say, well, for those 1%, I could think of a different interface. I could think of more advanced tasks to ask them to complete. I could perhaps try to figure out if they want to be in a different role to help with the moderation of the discussion forums. Because typically each of these projects has a bunch, uh, three to five scientists that, are, that have to take care of the whole community while doing their, their regular jobs. So this 1% of participants are committed. In the same time, this is important because it points perhaps to a bias. So this is perhaps less relevant in a task which is more or less objective. So either I see a galaxy of a certain shape or not. It is more important in, for those types of tasks which are more subjective. So when it is important to gather a range of answers from different people. The fact that only 1% of the 50,000 are the ones who gave me 30% of the answers means that pretty much whatever 
I have or whatever data I collect from this is going to be biased towards the mindset and the knowledge of those 1% and will not be as representative for the whole set of 50,000 users as I would, um, as I would uh, want them to be. Okay, so there seems to be this balance or lack of balance in the levels of activities, which is, which is not uncommon. A second thing that, that we want to look at, and this is, this is Amber's work, is related to data quality. Now, like, like I explained earlier, the problem is that we have a bunch of questions. When I say a bunch, I mean a million, and each question is asked to 100 people or so. So we get lots of answers back. But we cannot, or it makes no sense for us to check those answers manually. Ideally, you would want to ask 100 people the same thing, and from those 100 answers, to be able to get a signal for which of those answers that 100 people gave is correct or not. Now, this sounds easy, but it's not. And it's not for various reasons, because in most cases, the questions that people will have to ask or to answer are much more complicated than, say, you get a question and you answer it with yes or no. The questions look like this. Yeah, so this is, if you want to classify a galaxy, you go to Galaxy Zoo, you see an image. It's not going to be, the task is not going to be, can you see a galaxy, yes or no? It could be, but that, the answer is less, less useful. Instead, what it is more effective to do is to have a series of questions. Yeah, so do you see a galaxy? Do you see one, none, or several? Yeah, that's at the top. Now, if you see just one, is it more like this or more like this or, or completely flat? And so on and so forth. Now, there's a whole area of research that deals with just knowing what choices to make. So, how to identify those three choices automatically. But I'm not going to talk about this. Point is, this is a workflow, yeah? And we need now, and some people will give an answer here, an answer here, an answer here. So there are different, different possible answers. The question is, how to, if you have hundreds of them, how to identify the answer that is more likely to be correct? Both as a final answer, so the level here, and as a complete picture. So imagine you have 100 questionnaires and you cross your answers. You have 100 of them and you actually want to know which questionnaire is the most valid one. Yeah? This is extremely difficult to do because it takes lots of time to compute because um, you need to be able to identify at each step. It is an iterative process and you need to identify at each step um, where to go next. And the state of the art that we have works only for these one step workflows with yes and no answers. So what Amber is doing, and this is still work in progress, is she's looking at three types of algorithms. So these three types of algorithms go from something really straightforward, like here's 100 answers. Let's just take the majority one, yeah? To something a bit more complicated. You could imagine a system like with the electoral votes. So whoever wins this particular cluster goes up and gets a vote, yeah? You could imagine a system where you actually weigh the answers based on the performance of the answerer. 
So if you have voted the right way in the previous election, your vote counts higher now. That would be an interesting model to study. And so on and so forth, yeah? So these algorithms are available as standard versions, but they need to be extended to deal with these really, really complex workflows. So we've been computing and computing and computing and computing. Now, what we know at the moment is that as you have more and more data, so as you get more and more answers, you could just use majority voting. In other words, if you have a high turnout in elections, just take a direct vote and this is probably going to be fine. You're going to find the correct answer. If you have a very low turnout, then you probably need to use message passing, possibly in combination with something else. And then the question is how to do this efficiently, because as I said, it's an iterative process and there's lots of, um, of steps and, and, and complicated data structures. Okay, moving on. So data quality. If we solve that, what this would give us is basically a way to find the correct answer with higher certainty. Then we looked at how people engage with the task. And one standard way to do that, I say standard because everyone thinks it's going to work out for them, but in practice it turns out to be much more complicated, um, is to gamify the tasks. So we have, look, we have um, looked at several papers that describe citizen science projects which are gamified. We looked at 31 projects uh, and analyzed them and looked at, first of all, whether they understand themselves as a game or not. The reason why this is important is, is um, can be explained as, as, as follows. I mean, if you think about how you attract people to engage with your project, if you market something as a game, you will attract a different type of audience than if you say this is a science project contributing to, to science. Of course, you could do, could do both as well, but then that's more complicated and you're selling different stories. Um, so if the message is, here's a game, the question is, for some, do we need to make everything fun and entertaining for people? Can't we just assume that people are, are, are interested in science? Do they need all this decorum? If you do gamification and you give people points for everything, then perhaps you're incentivizing the wrong type of behavior. You actually don't want people to engage with your project just because they're getting more points. And in fact, you have to do this really, really well for this to work for, for over longer periods of time. So that's one part. People don't want to say that science is a game. Science is important and you're contributing to something important. Um, in the same time, others say, well, this allows us to engage with a whole range of audiences. We don't have to, I mean, people sometimes feel um, they do not have, they're not qualified enough to participate. So um, our colleagues from, from the Zooniverse were telling us this example once where they were um, launching a game which was about the analysis of um, pathology images for, for cancer research. Now this is a very serious topic. People felt somehow that they cannot engage with that project so easily because they were scared that if they give the wrong answers, this will really have implications on the life of, of people, yeah? Um, so perhaps emphasizing the science aspect too much also keeps some people away. So basically the, the, the topic of, of 
gamification and, and using games as a paradigm of engagement in citizen science is not solved yet. So what we have, there are examples of games, good and bad. Um, we have now done an analysis of them and we have tried to look at whether they classify themselves, as they understand themselves as a game or not. We have also tried to look at which types of elements they use, whether they work, and came up with a, with a number of, of recommendations. So, task design. This is very important when it comes to understanding citizen science as a way to um, to solve algorithmic or scientific problems with the human in the loop. It turns out that people like talking, right? No, that no matter what the task is, people will appreciate the opportunity to engage with the science team and to interact with each other. This is why like I said earlier, many projects or some projects are offering some sort of social channel because they believe, and there is some evidence for that, that this encourages community building, makes, makes volunteers work autonomously. So it's not just about the science team giving them images to classify, it's also about volunteers coming and saying, oh, let's look at this image and analyze it in more detail or let's go and do something, some, something else. And it leads in some cases to scientific discoveries by the volunteers themselves. So then we tried to understand this a bit better. Yeah? We tried to look at the relationship between work, as in images classified, time spent doing that, and time spent on discussions. And, and remember that there is just 1% of the users who do 70% of the talk. And again, we, we, have, we identify this area of highly active players, um, also in IOI, which is a study we've done in, uh, in, in 2015. And we have suggested ways to engage with that particular group of players. We've also looked at what do people talk about when they do? So depending on the types of messages, you could imagine a different form of engagement with them. You could imagine um, a different way to moderate. So for instance, one thing that we have found out and we c can't quite understand why is that um, in many cases, people in trying to ask questions via discussion forums, but the interaction and the answers they're getting are very limited. So everything that we know from well-moderated, successful discussion forums doesn't really seem to apply to citizen science because people are not going away. One reason could be that discussions are perhaps not the main reasons why they're there. But we still need to look into this because that 91% figure there is quite alarming. This means that in one of the four categories of discussion forums in Zooniverse, 91% of questions remain unanswered. So people go and ask questions and no one ever gets back to them. And they still go back next day and, uh, and classify galaxies. That's something you would ask an online community expert, you would ask someone who builds Q&A sites, oh, this will never happen. You're mad, you will need to find ways to you, uh, hire more moderators or do automatic moderation or promote some of the volunteers to moderators to do something. Uh, quickly, this is, this is some work that uh, Ramin mainly did for, for website um, last year. We looked even deeper uh, into these trade-offs between work and talk and, and identify not just highly active players as one very important profile of a volunteer, but, but uh, quite a few others um, that would then prompt the designer to treat them differently. Um, this is some more recent work that Neil has done um, where we really try to see 
whether um, citizen science projects can be understood as successful communities. And we've looked at 48 projects um, and various publications, and we looked at the literature in online communities and what they recommend to do to build a successful online community. And typically, they say four things are really, really important. The first of all is for people to know how they can contribute. The second one is for people to have a goal, ideally a common goal, that uh, they can work towards. The third one is feedback. So when they engage, they want to get something back. Uh, I don't mean a reward. I mean to interact with other people. And finally, they want to be rewarded in some way. And I don't mean necessarily financial rewards, but various others. So related to what I said about the 91% of questions that, that remain unanswered, so this hints at what we have found out. What we have found out in the survey is that those things that online community gurus think they're really, really important don't apply. But they don't apply in, 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 in some interesting, interesting way. And community features are not just a side effect or some sort of add-on to the actual task experience, but they're really central to encourage task completion. So related to the studies uh, from, um, that I mentioned earlier, we found out that if people talk more, for instance, during games in iWire, they would solve more tasks eventually, and it will take minimally more time, which probably accounts for the, for the typing in the chat window. So encourage task completions, and discussions have these positive side effects that I mentioned. Finally, we've looked at ecosystems. So I've mentioned this relationship between platforms and projects, and how platforms are important because there is a community that is generally interested. Um, so we have looked at contributions across different projects and identified relationships between them. So obviously there is, well, unexpectedly, um, there, is, there are relationships between um, projects in different subjects. So it seems that there are people who are there to contribute to projects, no matter whether they are in, in um, uh, transcribing old weather reports or, um, or looking at, at pathology images. They, they just like this sort of, of environment. But there are also people who seem to be very much interested in a particular area and contribute, say, to, to astronomy projects in, in, in one colored cluster. Mm -hmm. You can't see this. They'll have to uh, go through it quite quickly anyway. Um, it's, so this, this was some work that we have done uh, for, for Kai last year. We have interviewed now designers, systems designers, people who built projects. And we have tried to find out, um, we have asked them to look back at what they've done and identify things that are really, really important when, um, when projects um, are, are, are set up or need to run for a longer period of time. Um, so besides this, they confirmed this, this um, role of, of social features and, and, and communities, um, but they've also talked a lot about the role of discussion forums in what they call serendipitous discoveries that, that were unexpected or unplanned. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I guess you imagine from, from what I said that this is a wide area of research and we're still doing a lot and there are many people involved in this in ways and, and, and elsewhere. Um, but I've tried to come up with a list of things that haven't been so much touched upon in the papers um, that have been published so far here and elsewhere. So we still really don't know. So we have an understanding of different profiles of, of users based on their level of activity. Um, but we don't know how to translate this in a more effective way to assign tasks. 
So I think without exception, every citizen science project that assigns tasks automatically so that operates at scale, I don't mean, I, I don't mean the small offline project so much here, they do this completely randomly. So you go to a site, you see an image, yeah? No matter what you have done before, no matter how much or how less you have engaged with the project. Now this, it could be that you see images that are very similar to the ones you've seen before, images that are actually quite easy to process and you get bored, or on the contrary, you have, you are new to the site and you see a series of very challenging examples or, 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 or images that are completely blank um, um, or, or have not so much interesting going on in them. So mapping from <coughs> profiles, engagement profiles to, to tasks properly, I, I, I wouldn't know who, who is doing that for real or what sort of, of mapping from engagement features to task features would work. Data quality. Eventually, we will get to the bottom of those experiments. Um, <coughs> but it needs to be scalable. And in addition to that, actually, it needs to be in real time. Because you want to know, you want to reassign tasks. You want to know when to <coughs> consider a task completed based on the quality of the answers you're getting. Um, I mentioned the fact that you do not want to review all inputs from the community manually. And when I say you, I mean the professional scientists. The very few compared to the size of the community of volunteers, people, who are in charge of the citizen science project. What you could do instead is try to engage some of the volunteers, some of those 1% of the 50,000, to involve them in some form in the process. This means that you would, you would have a human in the loop. You would not necessarily need, or well, let me put it differently, no matter what data quality inference algorithm we come up with, it will not be 100% perfect. Um, you could also think about collaboration. So most citizen science projects online are uh, using this model where you go to the site and you solve the task, you classify the images yourself. You don't see, you can't change your answers and you can't see what other people are doing. Now the moment, why would you want to do that? Because people like to socialize. They, this can be a very lonely experience. Um, you also want to do this because um, you might want to um, allow people to help each other. I talked about gamification. Um, it's still a, a big debate and we need more experiments to understand how particular game elements link to, to, to results. Making discussions more effective. I've, I gave some, some, some examples uh, for that, but also um, finding the right means to engage with that particular community, which seems to react less to obvious design flaws that are criticized in the literature. And finally, something we at least here haven't really looked at yet, how to design platforms that everyone can use. So now Zooniverse, have a platform where you can set up your own citizen science project. Now, we don't know, we really don't know, there have 200 projects or so that have been launched by individual teams and designed by them. Um, there is much more to do in terms of usability of those platforms, in terms of the features that you need to add, and in terms of the guidelines that you would need to, to, to use. All right. so. The publications are all online. We're still working on this. Um, I haven't spoken at all about Stars for All, where we're looking at citizen science um, 
for a particular area, which is light pollution. Um, but if you're interested, talk to any of the people that I have mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Come and talk to me. Um, because, like I said, it is a fascinating subject and there are many challenges still ahead of us. Thank you very much.